I hope uh, you can hear me loud and clear. This is Stanley. Um, I'll be the presenter for today. So today we're going to go through a topic, okay, about disruptive business innovation. All right. So this is actually part of the Game Changer series, a series of webinars where um, I first said about advocating the, the actually the advancement of innovation at the same time to encourage better awareness okay, of what we have to offer in some of our courses. So um, just want to run through, make sure that everybody can hear me loud and clear. Okay, if you can't hear me, maybe you want to uh, actually switch on your volume so that you can be uh, aligned with me as I go on. Today, we have quite a fair bit of slides to cover. Uh, there's something like about 63, but don't worry, it's not about the number, but rather it's actually about what I can maximize in the next one to one half hours. Okay, without further ado, let me just um, run through with you very quickly, okay, about who I am. Okay, so obviously on screen, you can see who, uh, a bit of my profile, a bit of my background. Um, I have been teaching innovation and entrepreneurship for about six and a half years now. So currently still a faculty, I have taught undergrads, postgrads in the same area as well. And um, as, as much as I say, this is actually about you. So obviously the slide is all about me. So I don't think I want to spend too much time going through this. But let's go to the, actually the, the program proper. Okay, before we start going to the, the end of contents, um, I think it's important for me to set certain expectations. Right, this is what I usually advocate in my class. So I want to get them to do advanced reading, some preparations, etc. So that we align. So when we go through class, we can talk. Okay, but because this is a webinar, so it's not a real class, I will have to leave all the questions okay towards the end okay of the QA session. All right. Okay. So let's start talking about business model innovation. Okay, so what's business model? What's exactly a business model? A business model itself is a snapshot of what a company or an organization is doing at any stage of time. Okay, and of course, when you couple the word innovation behind, things become very bombastic. In fact, business model itself is a current big buzzword used by um, actually any business communities today. Innovation is another big buzzword. So when I combine two into one, you are getting two very robustic words. Okay, so what is business model innovation and how disruptive can business model innovation be? That will be the main theme of today's webinar. So I would like um, everyone who are with me, okay, to spend the next one hour with me, go through some of the contents. I'll try to make it as simple as possible, um, infused with quite a fair bit of case studies and examples to bring you up to speed. Okay, innovation. I think let's demeave um, the word innovation. A lot of people start to associate innovation with a lot of things. For example, creativity, um, entrepreneurship. Some people also equate innovation with invention. But I think in my perspective, okay, or in many people's perspective, innovation is just not the same. Somehow there's a difference. Here, I'm using one of my favorite definition. Innovation is a creation of a viable new offering. So first we need to know that innovation is not the same as invention. Invention, it could be new to the world, but if nobody is willing to patronize you, nobody is willing to buy your ideas or buy your service or your product, that is at best just invention. That's not innovation. So innovation will also mean it has to be value added. Okay, it must be financially sustainable in the long run. It must be able to pay for its own bills pay for its own expenses. So there's a need for customers to continue to buy from you, okay? To keep going back to you for the same actually proposition. And then finally, of course, the word new. Okay, a lot of people when say new, oh, it must be new to the world, just like what Steve Jobs did, okay? I must create the iPhone or the iPad. Nobody in the world has seen it before, so then that's treated as innovation. Surprisingly, it's not. Innovation, especially the word new, means it could be new to a market or it could be new to a country or even new to a city. It need not be new to the world, okay? And then lastly, the other actually big keyword is offering. So what's offering? Um, when I was teaching innovation for about six years, always do I, will I get this question, okay, from students. They always tell me, you know, it's always about product, service, or even process. 
I would like to bring you beyond that. Okay, we are also talking about things like systems, services, processes, or even business model and so on. Okay, one of the favorite books I use, okay, when I teach business model innovation is Business Model Generation. A very, very interesting book, okay, which was bought about in 2011, so it's about nine years old, okay, but still extremely powerful, as you're going to see later. I'm going to use these concepts to illustrate, to explain, okay, a lot more about how disruptive businesses can be, even to the extent that another digital business could disrupt a, another digital business on its own. So we are talking about two digital businesses disrupting each another, right? Okay, so business model innovation has four key objectives, okay? Let's look at the four key objectives. First, uh, the market doesn't really know what you want, okay? Or probably they have a need, but there's nothing out there to fulfill what they're looking for. So when you actually have business model innovation, you will try to go about fulfilling these unanswered market needs. Second is to bring new technologies, just like the iPads and the iPhones. Nobody in the world has ever seen it before. Through R&D, through research, now you have a totally new product. And then finally, you have actually the objective of setting up an improvement or you're trying to disrupt, change the rules of the game in the market, okay, through a better system or a better business model, okay. And of course, not forgetting to create an entire new market like what we saw in Netflix, right? So moving on to actually looking at the key objectives, each of these four objectives, here are some examples. Here we have Tata Motors. Tata Motors actually claims to be one of the world's actually cheapest car, okay? And that's produced by Tata Motors. So the entire car itself comes with no fuels, okay? It's meant and targeted at the uh, urban middle class. Not so much the rich, okay, but urban middle class, there's mushrooming, growing by, from strength to strength in India. So this car is interesting in the sense that it's just a few thousand dollars, okay, extremely cheap, not comparable to even a Toyota or a Nissan or even a Subaru, but it has its actually requirement and it has fulfilled its market uh, expectations as well, okay. So Tata Nano, this car, the world's cheapest car is there, okay, invited by this Indian conglomerate. Okay, and then next we have actually bring new technologies before the capsule coffee comes about okay by nespresso nobody really thought that coffee could be so condensed and so portable so disposable as well okay and so convenient gone are the days that you need to go to starbucks or you need to go to coffee bean just for a quick coffee fix you could actually bring back these brewing machines okay and then purchase all these capsules uh, from the comfort of your, of your home you could enjoy the next cup of cappuccinos or Nespresso's anytime that you want. So Nespresso bought capsule coffee, okay, to the world. And when they bought this to the world, they didn't come in in a big bang. Uh, everything that you see was being actually, was being sold, okay, to their own website. They didn't even have retail stores to start with. It's only in recent years, they decided to expand their market reach. That's why you start to see boutique stores. So when Nespresso first came about, it was to bring the capsule coffee to your home and not asking you or troubling you to make a rush to Starbucks or Coffee Bean, okay? So new technologies, new products comes about because of disruptive business model innovation. And then you have Nintendo, okay? So before that, you have heard of PS2, PlayStations, okay? Which is another company, Sony. But Nintendo itself was finding its, its fortunes um, failing after many years. They couldn't compete very much with Sony, okay, on the same footing for game consoles. They decided to step backwards, okay. They look at another different market. They look at people who are not so serious in gaming, not the hardcore gamers. Um, and in that, they found a very unlikely pool of audience. They found new markets in retirees, housewives, families, or the not so tech savvy gamer. Okay, and with one stroke, they created the Nintendo Wii. And Nintendo Wii was just actually the use of, uh, of your wrist, okay? So it's just some simple body movements. You can find yourself playing games at home with your loved ones, and not everybody needs to have very sophisticated gaming skills to start with. So when Nintendo first came about, 
uh, they were trying to compete with Sony in terms of technology advancements. Eventually, they realized that they couldn't win. They took a step backwards and they reconfigured the whole business model to create what we call the Nintendo Wii. Okay, and that created a phenomenon for them. Okay, all right, and then finally, the fourth objective is to create a brand new market like Zoom. Um, now we are actually delivering this webinar through Zoom. Before Zoom come, comes about, everybody would have preferred to step in a classroom um, and to see me in person or talk to me in person. But now, because of Zoom, it's so convenient. You're probably actually in your kitchen, you could be in your office, you could be in your bedroom while listening to me. And that is helping you to get around the boundaries of coming to school, okay, or coming to a physical location. So Zoom created an entire new market that's based on video conferencing, right? And that is extremely powerful, especially under this current situation. Okay, so having said that, this is what we mean by a business model, also known as a nine building blocks. Okay, it describes the activities of an organization, how they're intermingled, how they're configured and integrated, okay, to make sure that none of these four parts. In other words, in layman's term, this is basically what your organization is doing on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? And if they are not doing this, something is wrong somewhere. So it's a matter of time before you see problems surfacing. So if you look at it, you could see it as a snapshot. It's just like actually a photo. It gives you a snapshot of what something is given that stage of time at that period of time as well, okay? So it's very, very easy, very eye-friendly, nine boxes. Each, are, each of these boxes would mean something, a different value proposition. Okay, and in Business Model Canvas, if I were to ask more questions, okay, this is how it actually relates back to you or as an organization. Each of these boxes have implications on your business or your organization. Even if you are from a non-profit organization like a UC, or if you are for profit like any corporations, business model has to be there. There must be a business model around every organization for survival as well, All right? Um, this is actually the business model canvas of Coca-Cola. So I'm not going to spend too much time to run through each of these boxes with you because that will only be covered in the real class and um, due to time constraint, I have only roughly about an hour. So I would rather spend this time to zoom into each of these nine boxes and share with you a bit more what it What's the implication? How does it correlate to your organization or to your day-to-day -day activities? Okay, let's look at the first box. All organizations must exist to serve an intended audience. In this case, we call it the customer segment. Okay, these are the groups of people that you will go about serving every other day. Whether is it your donors, whether is it actually your beneficiaries in the case of a non-profit organization, or is it your customers in the case of a profit-making organization? So here are two key questions. Will you actually want to serve certain segments or you want to ignore certain segments? Because of limited resources, you can't be fulfilling the needs of the entire world. And not the entire world will buy from you anyway. So it makes perfect sense for you to segment your market and to design your business model around the needs of your customers or your intended audience. Okay, so with that, we can see a couple of possibilities. First, you could go for the mass market, okay, where you don't differentiate, okay, who's coming to you. Whoever is willing to pay, willing to buy from you, you just serve their needs. So you make standardization. You assume that all of your customers are pretty much within the, a narrow frame, okay? And then you can go for niche market. You look for pockets of customers where they're underserved, okay? And you try to cater to them. You try to understand them you will try to fulfill what they're looking for. So usually in a niche market, the, the size of the market is definitely much smaller, but it does not mean that the potential of the market is small because many organizations start from niche market. For instance, okay, when you look at actually um, Netflix, okay, Netflix started out as a DVD, okay, rental business. So when Netflix grows over the years, they realize that, okay, I can only cater to so much people. Let me take it digital. Let me serve the millions of people who are actually staying at home with some spare time. So that's when they did it digital, it become mass market. So niche markets can eventually become mass market, right? And then you have segmented. Segmented means I dissect the market. I look at 
different markets, okay, different segments, and each of the segments would have different interests or different requirements. So in the case of a school or a training institution, some of you could be adult learners, okay, where you're looking for people who are very established, very accomplished, with certain level of know-how. Others could be a lot younger, okay, you're probably looking at a diploma, you could be looking at even a degree, okay, but you may not have so much working experience. So by knowing actually your market, when you segmentize them, you will be able to cater your value proposition around their issues or their problems. So segmented market is another very common customer segment. Okay, diversified means these two markets have totally no relationship. Okay, in fact, not the slightest relationship. So how does it work? Pretty simple. Imagine us as a training institution, all of a sudden we go into f &B. We start selling food. We start operating restaurants. Totally unrelated, right? Education training doesn't equate, okay, pretty much to food. Unless you are, you're feeling hungry in school, maybe that's the only correlation. Otherwise, we should not be in the business of selling food or drinks. So diversification means you are going for two different segments, each with different requirements. And then finally, of course, you have your multi sided platform. Uh, multi sided platform is a very exciting business model today. In fact, if you open up your phones, all the apps that you see, literally almost all, they are all multi sided platform. Okay, and in multi sided platform, we are interested in maintaining two or more different individual customer segments okay and the segment okay the platform becomes very very attractive due to this effect what we call the network effect okay network effect it, uh, I'll, I'll be talking about that much later network effect gets a lot stronger when you have these audiences coming in using the same actual platform over and over again so we will talk about that in one of the slides later on so just bear with us for a while all right Let's move on to the second one, which is your customer relationship. So here it talks about the type of relationship, the type of understanding you want to establish with your customer segment. So three ways, either you acquire, you go and find new customers, or you retain, you keep your current customers, or you do upsell. You sell them something more than what they are buying. Okay, you promote, you do suggestive selling. Tell them, oh, you know, by the way, since you bought this, you will want to some, have something more than that. All right. Okay. And when you actually are able to influence your customer relationships, you will be able to influence what we call the CX, okay, customer experience, right? And this will actually give you a longer longevity for them to keep on coming back to you. What we call um, actually customer retention value, okay? And five categories of customer relationship that you see today, the major ones, personal assistance, okay, self-service, automated service, co-creation, and um, at communities. So personal assistance, when it's based on human, you don't really use robots to place, you have a person to talk to, what actually usually the banks use or the call centers use. There will always be a human person answering at the end of every conversation. Okay, self-service, in this case, there is no direct relationship. You expect your customers to help themselves, also known as DIY. Okay, customers will do the packing, Customers will do the payment or on their own. Something that you see when you visit IKEA or even NTUC, FairPrice, or even Cold Storage today, okay? Because of COVID situation, uh, if possible, they don't even want you to talk to actually a cashier, right? So you have to do everything on your own. So that's self-service. And then what's automated service? Automated service is a combination where I use a bit of robotics, a bit of AI, okay? To replace the need for a human. When you go to uh, certain websites like eBay, Lazada, okay, or Groupons or Taobao, whatsoever, when you, the moment you log in your IDs and the password, you will say actually the whole website transforms and is catered to you based on your last purchase. You don't really need to talk to a human, okay, but yet they are able to do suggestive selling, promoting certain products that you may be likely to buy. So that's automated service, right? And then you have co-creation. Once again, another very exciting um, way of disrupting a business model, okay, where you actually ask your customers, okay, or your prospects to help you to design your goods and services or your offerings. Um, no longer will you depend purely on your R&D department, but rather, in this case, you would like your customers to give you more valuable inputs, okay, and help you to create the next big intake. So co-creation is becoming very powerful today, especially in the areas of sustainable practices. 
right? And finally, communities. These are what we call ecosystems. Uh, something like Apple has done for many, many years. Okay, they created the App Store. Okay, and they encourage you to buy iPhones and all iPhones come with an App Store. And the moment when, once you start using your App Store, you're literally hooked because every app that you have is all linked back to Apple somehow or rather. Okay, so it, you use that same community to engage your customers so that they can help you to give you feedback, to help you to give suggestions for other products or even to create your own product. Think of YouTube's, okay? How many uh, videos does YouTube really produce every day? In fact, literally none. They were dependent on us to create all these contents for them. And what gets other people excited is exactly the contents that we are creating as a nobody or, or as a complete stranger, not even an owner of YouTube, okay? All right, so going to a third box, okay, key resources. These are the assets that you must have on hand. It allows you to create and promote a value proposition to go to the market or to maintain relationship with your customers and even earn revenues. Okay, different resources depending on the type of business you have. So you have human, financial, intellectual, physical uh, resources, which are very common, right? In, in any business, you must have all these four ingredients there. Otherwise, you will run out of resources or actually capabilities. Okay, key partners. These are people who are external, outside of your organization that you're working with to promote your business activities. So they create alliances for these three reasons. To optimize a business model, like in the case of Walmart, they need all these actually suppliers to be able to supply them as and when the goods are running low. Okay, so all these actual suppliers will be able to provide what we call JIT just in time. Okay, um, actually deliveries to them just be just before the next last product in their warehouse runs out, the suppliers will be there to restock. So it's just exactly minimizing wastage. The second reason why they create a lens is to create a reduced risk. Sometimes certain projects could be too massive, right? Too expensive, too resource constraining. Uh, for example, in our Singapore's case, you have actually the Thomson East Coast Line. The Thomson East Coast Line costs billions of dollars to build. No construction company can take on this type of risk. So what is being done is that the whole Thomson East Coast Line is subdivided into different sections. And each of these sections is being handled by a joint venture, usually a collaboration between two construction companies or two design firms. Okay, to partner, to, to actually to work together, to see it to flotation. And then the last reason is to acquire resources. Not all resources are within your reach. So when you, you need certain resources, but it's not in your belonging, you will have to find it. You have to source for a partner to acquire them from. So in that, okay, there's a need for you to depend on your key partners. All right. So some activities are outsourced, some are brought inwards. Um, so you can see on screen, strategic alliances between non-competitors. So in this case, they see a win-win situation. They will want to work together. Cooperation is something very new, um, especially when you have two competitors coming together to actually to conquer a market or to win over some market share. Especially in the case of COVID right now, okay, you realize that a lot of pharmaceutical companies are forgetting whatever actually uh, rivalries they have. They are working together to find the next vaccine. And this is actually literally cooperation in your right in your face. Okay. And then of course the others will be joint ventures, buyer supply relationships, which are quite common. Okay, key activities. So these are the things that you must do on a daily basis. In fact, they are the most important things that you must do. Otherwise, the entire business model will just collapse. It's also literally what an organization is supposed to provide on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, so these are the key activities that you should be doing. Uh, one, you create a value proposition for customers. You create, you offer, you extend it to your customers, hopefully they'll buy that and they'll patronize you or continue to patronize you. Second, you will try to find ways through advertising, promotion, marketing, to go into new markets, to reach your market, to, to actually make this product available to your customers. The third action, will be to maintain your customer relationship. You want to keep your existing customers and grow, okay, the amount of revenues from each one of them. 
and to prevent them from switching over to another competitor. So the third activity is talking about maintenance of customer relationship. And the last one, which is the most important, is to earn money, okay, earn revenue. So earlier I said, innovation must be financially sustainable. This is where the sustainability comes from. If a actually invention is not able to even collect its first dollar, it is not sustainable because item four, in this case, is completely non-existent. So an organization must be able to earn revenue for it to be able to survive in the long run. So three activities, these are three activities, production, problem solving, and platform, okay? So platform is what we call the multi sided okay, platform system. And today is probably one of the most actually uh, accessible and the most visible okay, activities that anyone can think of. But there are others. For example, problem solving, when you go into consultancy firms, you go to hospitals, you will like the doctors to be able to tell you what's wrong with you. Okay, and even prescribe the right cure. Platform is the one that's most exciting because many businesses today are all designed around platforms and networks. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in into one of these platforms and share with you how the business model exactly works. Okay, revenue streams, all organizations should have revenue streams <coughs> because they need to generate the cash, right? Two types, transactional revenues and recurring revenues. Transactional revenues are usually one time. You buy something from me, I will give you the product or the service, okay? You pay me the money, that's the end of our relationship. So it's usually one time. <coughs> recurring revenues are happening at fixed period of every interval, usually every month, every week, okay? And organizations today are trying to shift away from trans transaction revenues towards recurring revenues because recovering revenues are more predictable. Okay, transactional revenues are short lived very short term. So some um, business owners have been asking me, so if I'm gonna make, I wanna make more money, which is better, transactional revenue or recurring revenue? Well, honestly, if you want more predictability, you should go for recurring revenues because you can foresee that someone will not immediately cancel on you. Okay, and there's a relationship that's keeping the, actually the, um, the business transactions warm, right? So seven ways of generating revenue. These are seven ways. So you have asset sale, advertising, use, usage fee, licensing, so on and so forth. So I just want to give you some examples here. Like asset sale, I can sell something of value. Like I sell away my car. Okay, I can still generate revenue or I can sell away the building. Advertising, in the case of media and events, I will help you to do promotion but you have to pay me certain rates, okay? And then usage, like hotel stays or delivery charge. Every time you use me, I'll charge you an agreed amount upfront. Licensing, in the case of Disney, I will allow you to use my name and my trade names for a given period of time, provided that you give me royalties in return for licensing rights. And then finally, brokerage, okay? Where I try to double up as a multi-sided platform, I act as a middleman. I help you to connect to actually different audience together. And in between, I earn my commission or I earn my incentive, okay? So online games use that as well. And then finally, of course, leasing, okay? Where I, instead of me buying, owning that set, I can just borrow, I can just rent, or I can just lend it for a given period of time, okay? And finally, your subscription fees where it, this is based on monthly recurring, okay? Every month, just like your newspaper, if you have it delivered to your home, you agree to pay $20 to the delivery guy. So subscription fee runs on a monthly basis usually. It could be also on a yearly basis, okay? And these are the seven ways where you generate revenues. So channels, how do you reach out to your customers? Okay, a few ways. So communication, distribution, and sales channels. These are touch points. That plays a very important role in the experience. These are the three main ways. Use your own, use your partners, or you combine the two, okay, into one. Okay, these are the functions, okay. They, the, the reasons why they exist, how they go about helping you. To raise product awareness, okay, helping your customers to evaluate a value proposition, 
or to even promote customer support. Okay, value proposition is basically the reason why people come to you. There's usually a selected bundle of goods and services. Okay, and it helps to solve um, um create a new market, solve a problem, or to fulfill a customer need. Right. Okay, these are the ten reasons why uh customers will choose you over another company. So newest, okay, performance, and then customization, where I try to configure according to your needs. So here M and M, okay, refers to the M and M chocolates. Okay, M and M chocolates. Um, the the actually the owner Cadbury does allow you to customize the wrapping. Okay, so you can even put your own name, but you know that it's actually M M because um the chocolates look exactly the same, right? It's just that you can customize the packaging, and then you have cost re reduction, okay, getting a job done like Rolls Royce. Okay, when Rolls Royce actually service the airlines. Providing the airplanes, okay, they go to all these actually Airbus and Boeing and say, you know, I don't need you to buy the engines from me. I would just like you to land, land, okay, or to lease it from me, okay. For every hour that there are the planes in the air, just pay me an agreed amount. I'll service you. I'll repair them, okay. I don't need you to buy them, but I just want to actually charge you for every hour that in the air. Okay, you have. Convenience, usability, you make it so easy, so idiot proof that anyone can use it. You can obviously go for brand status, prestige, like a Rolex watch. And then you can also go for price. Okay, you try to keep your cost low, as low as possible, even to the point of making it free. And then finally, you can make it accessible. Okay, uh, NetJets is a private jet company. So in the past, um, which corporations will be able to afford a private jet? Okay, and maintain that. Anytime their top executives want to fly, they can fly. But that just disrupted this whole aviation system. NetJets maintains a fleet of private jets where they will only charge you based on per hour okay, of usage. So for example, if you are living in Singapore, you're going to other countries, you want to take a private jet, you can just call NetJets instead of buying a whole jet to yourself. So you just pay by the hour, right? And then you have designs. Some that's very visually appealing, it captures your eye. In the case of an iPhone, okay, it's very stylish. So these are the 10 reasons why people buy. But you realize that actually having said so much, we have not covered the most important aspect, which is the cost. Some cost models are more expensive than others. So there are two types, cost driven or value added driven. So cost driven will be when I want to keep my cost as low. Value driven will be, will be when I focus on my customers, I want to keep them happy. I'll give them the most whatever I can. So with that, it brings me back to actually the whole business model. Okay, we have done a very quick run through of each of these nine boxes. Okay, in class, I will explain a lot more, but because of in the interest of time, I'll prefer to zoom into the patterns. Okay, this is pattern number one. Okay, in, but in most business models, it can be very complicated, especially in the case of a multinational corporation. But multinational corporations always subscribe to this, okay, abundant business model. So to understand them, we need to unbundle the business model, okay? So all MSCs will usually follow three um, types of business. Customer relationship business, product innovation business, or infrastructure business. And each has different economic, com competitive, and cultural dimensions, okay? All three can be existent. Okay, and the reason why MSCs are really difficult for you to decipher and to interpret is because they are mixing three business models into the same organization. So to understand them, you need to first dissect them. Okay, this is actually the customer relationship business model. Okay, this is your business in the product innovation businesses. And this is your, finally, your infrastructure. So all MSCs usually subscribes okay, to at least two to three of such business models, infusing that into the same organization. And that's the reason why when you look at MSCs, they seem to be involved in every single thing, right? And that's why they're complicated. Okay, but it's not really difficult for you to decipher them. In fact, uh, it's a very, very powerful business model, as you can see in the case of Singtel. Some of you, um, could be a customer of Singtel. You probably have your consumer um, phone lines from Singtel. But Singtel also educates itself involved by selling bandwidth okay, and talk time to other telcos. 
Okay, for example, in its early days, it was selling airtime to StarHub. Okay, and later on, it was selling its, its actually airtime to other Australian telcos, etc. Those who want to enter the telco business. So Singtel, instead of selling to actually consumers like you and me, they were selling to their competitors, okay, for actually the airtime. And in that, they will be able to collect revenues from infrastructure business. But is that all? That's not all. Singtel would also go into a B2B, selling co to corporations one-on-one, -on -one, where they help you to set up corporate lines. They will sell you corporate plans, so and so forth. So in Singtel, you can literally see three types of businesses all combined into one. But is Telco the only business that has this? No, the banks have this as well. So like you and me, all of us could go into consumer banking, we deposit our hard-earned savings into the bank, earning the interest. Uh, corporations, enterprises do that as well. So they go into actually private banking or even enterprise banking. So if you think that consumer banking, enterprise banking is all they got, not exactly. DBS have a training institute called DBS Academy. And in DBS Academy, which is located in Changi, they go about training the bankers, okay, or the other banking professional from their competitors in return for training fees. So even DBS would have to transform their business model. And if you look at today's banks and today's telco, they are not pretty much like the good old days 10 years ago. Today, they are investing in a lot of startups, they are investing in a lot of side businesses, diversifying their interests, so and so forth. So unbundled business models is usually applicable for MNCs, okay, or even large local companies. So in my class, I will explain a lot more, but in the interest of time, because we have enough four patterns, so we are a bit rushing. So I hope you, you can pardon me for jumping. <laughs> okay, let's go to pattern number two. Okay, what we call the long tail. As the name suggests, where does the long tail come about? The long tail comes about as a result, okay, of this orange columns, okay? It's literally a tail of a kangaroo. It's just like kangaroo, okay? So in this business model, you see that a small number of best sellers, okay, creating most of the revenues. And in this case, it will be the columns in blue, okay? You see, there's, in this case, there's only four best selling items. But you have a lot of others which are not selling as well, but yet you still want to keep them under the same inventory, under the same roof, because in this business model, consumers come to you because they perceive that you have the most number of products. Okay, regardless of their needs, they will like to come and try their luck, okay, by making a trip to your store or by at least exploring what you have on hand. So this is actually a very powerful business model, um, a very old business model as well. And in this business model, you need to have very low inventory costs. The cost of keeping stock should be as low as possible. And you need to have a very strong platform, okay? Something that people are aware of so that they know who to turn to. And finally, you need to make as much contents available to interested buyers. So when can we see this? How do we see this? Okay, this is exactly how the business model looks like. Okay, quite simple, uh, but you will have to dissect into each one of them. So in class, I will go through each one of them as well, okay, to see how it's disruptive in nature. Netflix, okay, earlier I mentioned Netflix started as a DVD, okay, rental business. So why did they decide to go into online streaming? Because the two founders find that, okay, since actually internet speed is picking up, people are buying more and more mobile devices, uh, people are spending more and more time at home, so why can't I actually provide an alternative form of entertainment? And in this case, it's movies on the net. Okay, and they were spot on. In the first year of their existence, they had something like 15 million subscribers. Okay, the moment they decide to transform from a physical DVD rental store into something that's digital based, they have 15 million in just the first year of operation. So isn't that phenomenal? So what's so disruptive in Netflix? Okay, why is it actually a threat? Well, it's definitely a threat, okay, to any businesses that is taking away your available time. So in this case, it's not a threat just to the cinemas. It's also a threat to any other form of gaming businesses, like games, you know, even entertainment like karaoke's, uh, or even actually even the F&B joints. As long as you are free, Netflix seems to be everywhere, 
it allows you to watch movie on the go as well. So that's the part where Netflix is really disrupting. And they were adopting the long tail. When you go to long to Netflix, you see thousands and thousands, even millions of shows. My God, how many people can finish watching all of these titles? Not many, right? You probably will be struggling with just by finishing five of them, your favorite five movies. But Netflix draws millions, millions of people from the world because they actually have that tremendous amount of movie inventories. Okay, so Netflix is using the long tail. All right, so earlier I said it's a very old school okay, business model because it was borrowed from the supermarket. You're right, the hypermarket. When you go to NQC, Fair Price, Cold Storage, or any other hypermarkets, you see millions, okay, thousands, or if not actually tens of thousands, or even millions of products. So, what exactly enticed you into NQC? So, how did NQC Cold Storage use the long tail to its greatest effect? That's when they advertise every Thursday in all the main papers. Oh, here's actually a special bargain day, you know. Uh, come to my store, you know, there's a particular meat product or fish product or something that's specially discounted. Instead of usual price 990, now you can get it today at only 290. So people who are bargain hunters, people who would like to actually be on the lookout or adventure, okay, are adventures in nature, they will go by to NTUC or they will try to actually at least make a trip to the store to pick up their special item or their discounted item. But how many people really goes to NTUC to pick up only one item? And that's exactly where you're being hooked. Okay, you go to NTUC, they entice you with the long tail, they are going to use another innovation technique, okay, call, bait and hook. Okay, they are going to bait you with their discounted product and how are they going to hook you? They are going to hook you by persuading you to buy more. And uh, housewives, retirees, uh, students, even myself, as a working professional, I always end up buying more than just that discounted item. So long tail has its greatest effect, okay, when you hold a lot of inventories and the cost of holding them are tremendously low, right? Okay, the third business model pattern, okay, earlier I mentioned this is one of the most exciting one because this is what all the venture capitalists are looking at, a multi-sided platform, also known as a modern middleman, okay? It brings along two different customers, usually independent on both sides of the equation. And it actually helps to connect them together. And you try to serve as the switchboard. You're the in-between, okay? The other customers, first group of customers will not know the second group if you're not around, vice versa. So it's of value, tremendous value, to one group of customers when the other group of customers are there. Okay, think of you as a passenger. Like for example, when you go to Grab or you go to Uber. Okay, you're a passenger. If there's no private cars or no taxis available for hire, why would you even bother to use the app? And that's exactly where Grab and Uber gets you because you're one group of customer and then there's a group of drivers out there looking for passengers. So Grab comes into play. Okay, I'm the middleman. Let me help you do the connection, facilitate the transaction, and from there, I'll earn my commission. Okay, so increase value by helping okay by persuading the two groups to interact it could be two or more may not be just two and it goes in, in value because of the network effect the more people there are the more tremendous the network effect will be so here um i can't zoom in too much to talk about network effect but i promise in class i will share a lot more okay and the business model of multi-sided platform okay so this is actually what they focus on they look at business activities they look at the platform, they look at their call center, okay? What is most important to them? And then uh, next, they'll go and design, okay, to a first group of customers, a unique value proposition. So to riders like us, okay, people who are passengers, where you take private car, what's of value to you? Convenience. You don't really need to stand by the roadside, flagging a vehicle, right? You don't need to actually have loose change inside your wallet. You just need to have a digital wallet. And best still, you don't even need to wait for the vehicle to arrive. Okay. In fact, you just need to actually just tap your, your app. Okay. And once a vehicle is there, you will be notified. So that body position was really exciting to passengers like us. Okay. We, we, that's where you get the revenue flow. So what does Uber or Grab get? Okay. When the customers pay, okay, through the app, okay, there will be a revenue flow 
going to the actually to the driver. And part of this fare that was collected, okay, something like about six percent, okay, ten percent in fact, okay, it goes back to Grab or Uber as commission. Okay, and on top of that, the rider, because uh, the actually the driver, right? Okay, by being able to find you, they will also have to pay a booking fee or a commission back to actually Grab as well. So this is how actually they go about creating the second set of value proposition. In this case, to the drivers. So first value proposition was to the passengers. Second value proposition was to the drivers. And from there, they collected their second revenue flow, which is commission again. And finally, the third value proposition. Some of you may be using Grab for more than just a ride. You are probably using Grab food as well. Okay, especially very prevalent during the lockdown period. So for hungry um, people like us, okay, we will use Grab food because it's so convenient. We don't want to even step out of the house. That was convenience. Food delivered to your doorstep. Okay, was value proposition number three. To hungry, okay, um, actually customers like us, that was the segment. And finally, they charge the restaurants, okay, a commission for every single food item they ordered. All right. And in this case, for multi seller platform, there is a need, okay, for them to start by losing money. So, how do they lose money? They will have to make the platform free first, okay, usually subsidizing or incentivizing one group of customers to build up the traction before others will come about. So, in the case of Grab, what Grab did was just to actually pay, okay, incentives to the drivers first. Okay, so a lot of drivers enticed by the commit by the incentives will hop on. Okay, and it builds its fleet size to the extent that it's able to match Comfort Delgo or any other taxi companies. And that's when people like you and me, who once will have actually a speedy ride, we will go to Grab and we will start to place our first booking. Okay, so multi seller platform, like what I mentioned, was very, very commonly used by Grab. But the Grab just thought at just transport no they went on to parcels they went into now even money okay so grab has what we call grab pay right so that's also connecting merchants with customers and they are also starting to sell movie tickets okay concerts right Con connecting you from uh, actually a venue from a performer from a group to actually interested concert goers like us so grab is going to use this multi seller platform to build its attraction. So, how disruptive can this be? Well, you have very effectively replaced all the taxi companies. Now, you're going to replace okay, all the restaurants okay, in terms of those that are providing their own delivery business. And then finally, you're going to replace people like Cystic if you're going to go into movies, bookings, etc. Right? There's no longer need for reservation agents. And then finally, of course, hotels, so on and so forth. Okay, LinkedIn is an example. In LinkedIn, it connects people who are interested in furthering their career prospects with advertisers. In this case, companies who are looking for talents. So LinkedIn earns from advertisers, but it's free to achieve job seekers like us. But it doesn't mean that LinkedIn is not making its money. It still makes its money, okay, but through another form. All right, pattern four, okay, is what we call the freemium. Uh, as exciting as free lunch may be, but usually the free lunch comes with a caveat, okay? It comes with a condition. So what's the condition in the freemium model? Okay, at least one customer segment must be willing to pay and is able to benefit, okay? The other segment can enjoy a basic okay, offering by not paying a single cent. So in this case, you have two groups of audience, people who are using the product free and people who are willing to upgrade to pay a lot more for enhanced offering. So here, the condition, at least one customer segment must be available. It must be present. And this customer segment must be able, okay, to enjoy free stuff, to build up the traction and the base, All right? So different patterns makes the offer possible, okay? And non-paying customers are in a way subsidized by another part of the business model or by another customer segment. And this customer segment will be those people who are willing to top up and pay, upgrade. Okay, so let's examine how a business model will look like in the freemium. Okay, this is freemium. So for the first group, people who are not willing to pay a single cent, like me. I, I mean, when I go into Spotify, 
sorry, I don't pay for Spotify because it's free music on the go. Um, yeah, I know it burns data, but so be it. I'm not willing to pay the $10, okay, as much as low it is. So I enjoy basic services, all right? Um, and because it's free, when things are free, it builds tremendously fast. Okay, Spotify has a few hundred million users every other day, okay? So you have a very large base, and because that's free, uh, it's a free service, there's no revenue or whatsoever or cost, but there's a cost, okay, to service, right? And then you have the freemium model, that's when people start to upgrade. Pay 990 to get uh, ever free, okay, Spotify streaming, or they decided to go for enhanced features. Uh, even in the case of Gmails, uh, you all know that you all can top up, okay, to get a bigger um, actually capacity in terms of your mailbox. So that's actually freemium at work. People who, who are not willing to pay, you get the basic service, okay, but people who are able to pay or willing to pay gets better service. Okay, and it's the premium, okay, users that's subsidizing the free users. Okay, and what's of tremendous importance to premium operators? They will need to look at those in blue. Okay, they'll have to spend a lot of money building infrastructure, maintaining it, making sure that it's user friendly. They will have to make sure that the biggest trump card they have on hand is the platform. Without the platform, everything collapses. Okay, and finally, they will need to keep their costs as low as possible. If possible, fixed cost. There should not be too much of a variable cost, right? And with that, um, Zoom, okay, the platform that I'm using today is a freemium. Every one of you can re register for, for a Zoom account. You don't need to top up, don't need to pay anything more. But uh, for advertisers, okay, or for people who are like running conferences or training, we need to pay a lot more, okay, to make this possible because there's a limitation to how many users can be on the platform. And time-wise, it's another limitation as well. So people who are not willing to pay or you have very limited use for Zoom, it's fine. You can just use a, the free service. But if you want to use a lot more of the same platform, you have to subscribe and pay, right? So Zoom is an example. Let's look at Spotify, okay? Spotify, I mentioned that earlier, I don't pay, but it doesn't mean that others are not paying. Okay, let's look at Zoom into Spotify. Okay, so this is where the case study comes in. Spotify launched in 2006, okay, it's a free online music service. So the main purpose of Spotify was to compete against pirates, software pirates, music pirates that can be found on the web. Okay, and its main revenue comes from users who decide to upgrade to a freemium account, okay, or a freemium subscription. So started as a music platform, gives people to a lot of access, okay, to free music. Okay, it uses the freemium revenue model. So here, item one is for free users like me, people who don't pay. Item two is for people who decide to upgrade for $9.90 a month. Okay, and then it relies a lot on its music algorithms. Two is music algorithms and its communities and its artists. It can keep its premium experience very delightful or even refreshing. Every week when you look into Spotify, they always tell you, you know, there's a free uh, chart list, okay, a uh, few music chart where new songs are available, and it's actually all curated to suit your year, okay, to year, your year buds, okay. It saw itself as a legal alternative to pirated music, okay. Before Spotify comes about, in the past, people were just downloading MP3s, okay, illegally off the web, okay, to all the uh, illegal streaming softwares. Spotify sees that as a mission. It wants to actually become the alternative to pirated music, where people can just enjoy music on the go without getting worried that they'll be sued okay, by all these music labels. And its subscription base grew okay, by 10% okay, to 46% within a period of five year, uh, seven years. So it's a tremendous jump of 36%. Right? Okay? And it also pays a lot of its revenue okay, in the form of royalties to music labels. It has paid something like about $10 billion in royalty since 2006 okay to four main music labels sony warner uh, universal music and there's another one which i can't remember okay so there are four main music labels where they have collected something like 10 billion okay in royalties of this 10 billion dollars in royalties okay literally 9.5 billion was actually incurred by the free uh, by the paid users only 0 0.5 billion in royalties were paid for the free users. 
So there's a reason why uh, people have to pay okay, for a premium account because in the first place, you use a lot of music. And this music doesn't come free. Spotify have to pay off their suppliers. In this case, will be the music labels. Okay, and how disruptive is Spotify? It disrupted iTunes in the process. Well, instead of me going to iTunes to pay $1.99 for one music or one song, I can go to Spotify and have unlimited music for $9.99. So in the process of Spotify's emergence and growth, iTunes suffered tremendously. And was it just iTunes that suffered? It was MP3, okay? All these illegal MP3 music files that you saw that suffered first, eventually in the process, due to streaming, okay, Spotify literally is killing off Apple iTunes as well, okay? For the first time, it has made its profit last year. Okay, so earlier I said, um, actually in the case of freemium and multi-seller platform, they will be burning a lot of money, even though it's highly sought after, because they haven't found a way to monetize. So Spotify has managed to find its way to monetize in in um, in the last one year, right? Okay, let's look at actually the, the business model, exactly, exactly what happens to Spotify as a freemium provider. This is exactly what happens when it's free. Okay, so let's start with actually the music value offering. It's free music streaming, no cost. So targeted and music lovers, okay, on the right side. And the music lovers, eventually, because it's free, there's no revenue streams coming in. So Spotify, in order to offer this music content, you will have to prevent all these music lovers from switching to other alternatives. It has to keep them, okay, and to keep uh, the chunk weight low. It must constantly go into new okay, subscrib subscribers. You must keep on marketing, advertising to attract youngsters, to attract music lovers to join the platform, okay? And in that, they have two different user base, the freemium model and the premium model. So people who are free can still use it, but basic infrastructure. People who are willing to pay, they will come under the premium user model. And through that, they will use a platform, a common platform. So Spotify uses a lot of money a lot of resources to keep its platform robust, okay, and even user friendly. So in this free and premium user base, there will be a need to pay royalties, okay, okay, to the music labels, right? And that is how the whole platform goes about. Okay, this is in the case of premium, people who are willing to pay. So premium music streaming attracts premium users. Premium users will pay nine 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 a month back to Spotify, and Spotify will have to keep its platform, okay, very robust to make sure that premium music streaming is possible. And in that, they will have to convince, okay, the premium users to keep using Spotify to collect royalties and pay off their suppliers of four music labels, okay? So in, in actually the whole business model is quite straightforward, okay? You can see very clearly because of the different colors, one is actually for the free users and the other one is for the premium users, all right? Okay, so what have they done? They attracted a large base. They started attracting a large base. Usually, they give it to you free, okay? When you first started with Spotify, there's no need to pay a single cent. And then they try to convert all these free users, convince you, oh, you know, it's just 999, okay? It's unlimited songs. Um, you don't have ads, okay? You can skip your songs anytime. And the quality, sound quality is so much better than the free the free account. So they try to convince as much as these free users to upgrade. And then they also try to retain, stop you from leaving. They try to convince you, oh, you know, because of your preferences, because of your music selection, we are the best, you should stay with us. So they keep actually the chunk rate extremely low. Okay. And they will also try to balance. They have to balance the cost, freemium versus premium. Of course, the freemium subscribers must be more than the freemium providers, right? Or the revenue that's collected from the freemium users must be more, okay, in order to cover the cost of servicing the free users. So in that, they need to do a balancing act, okay? Sony, Universal, Warner, and Merlin were the four record labels, okay? And in 2008, 18, 3.5 billion pounds were paid, okay, with a lot more paid, okay, to, for free users. And finally, they will have to finance everything Okay, through the premium revenues. So when you do a balancing act, 
they realize that only 54% of their total users are free users. So that means 46% were all subscribing to the monthly subscription. And that's exactly how the entire Spotify business model works and disrupts iTunes in the process. Because no longer do you need to pay 199 or 099 for a song. It's unlimited. And all these premium users were enticed. Okay, and they have been growing ever since 2006. Right? Okay, the last business model, okay, uh, just to leave the case studies a bit, we okay, come back to the last business model. This is what we call the open business model. So in open business model, there are two types. Outside in, okay, that means I bring ideas from outside, complete strangers to a business. I bring these ideas into my company. So I exploit the ideas from outside the company. I bring them in, okay, or I go inside out. I use my R&D my research labs to push out new ideas and then before introducing it out to the market. Okay, uh, in the case of outside in, this is what you see. I will actually try to use outside ideas, okay, through my key activities, create value proposition, okay, to bring something in. And in the case of Kickstarter, Kickstarter is a platform. So they are one of the entrepreneurship platforms and innovation platforms when people can pitch to investors, okay, or donors, with their business ideas. In return for that, every donor will get a reward, okay, for whatever amount they pledge. Okay, however, Kickstarter doesn't own any assets. Neither does it own a viable pool of funds. It's not a fund house, neither is it actually a bank. It's just a platform. So it facilitates people who are looking for funding, okay, business owners to be, versus people who have spare cash, Okay, looking for the next exciting investment. So Kickstarter goes about facilitating that. Okay, and Kickstarter earns commission in between once a project go live. Okay, and then the next example I have is actually uh, what we call Singapore Donate.SG. Uh, okay, so this is actually a local um, actually donation platform where you, because of the COVID situation, right? So the government has given you some actually extra cash out, payouts, etc. So you can actually donate all this money, okay? But you, there's so many beneficiaries in Singapore, so many charities. Who do you donate to? You can just go to a crowdsourcing platform, pledge your money, say you want to donate back your $300, and this platform will distribute, okay, your donations, okay, to all these beneficiaries under their umbrella. So they actually use outside ideas, okay, that means your funds, they bring it to the organization, okay, the platform, before they distribute that to all the beneficiaries. And in between, they will make their, their key. Okay, so outside in, the another business model, a sub-business model, is when things happen in the labs, okay? And because of your lab results, your R&D, etc., you try to go about finding a market, a new market. And in that, usually you can use a platform, or a product. So in that process, you'll find out about revenue streams, you'll find new revenue streams, where you can spin off, sell off the entire, entire subsidiary, or you could actually just keep it in-house and charge licensing fees for patents. Okay, in that you'll see Dyson. Dyson's headquarters is in Singapore. So um, the founder, Dyson himself, okay, Mr. Dyson, um, he actually took a uh, lot of attempts to invent what we call the world's first backless vacuum. This is a very, very expensive vacuum, okay, in comparison to other traditional vacuum cleaners. Because first, you don't see much of wires, it's cordless. Second, it's backless as well. There's no need for you to buy vacuum bags, okay. And the other very interesting thing about this is that uh, it operates on battery, okay. So there's no need for you to plug in to any power supply. So this was actually a result of Mr. Dyson's experimentation in the labs. Okay, and how many times have he experimented? Well, he has tried something about 3,000 times before he found this product, this protocol, the prototype that can work. So everything was conceptualized in the lab. He decides to bring it out, sells it to the market, and finally you see Dyson going from, actually from this backless vacuum cleaner to hair dryers, to uh, a lot of other household equipment. Okay, even fans, so and so forth. So Dyson was using what they found in the labs before they shift it out to the market and let the market attest for themselves whether there's viability. Okay, another example, okay, inside out. This is when um, there's a collaboration between NTU, 
LTA, okay, Land Transport Authority, and Volvo. Volvo is the last player to come about. In fact, it is the third player to come about. Originally, it was just a pilot test, okay, coming out from NTU's lab, Nanyang Technology and University's lab. Um, they tried to, this, to actually create the world's first autonomous bus, which eventually they succeeded to a certain extent. They were trying to run it, going for pilot test. So this bus, okay, hovers within NTU campus. Okay, so there's no driver. And LTA was supporting it. LTA was actually trying to encourage this project to take off. So is this pretty much contained? And finally, Bo comes to the picture and says, okay, you know what? I am also an automobile um, provider, okay, manufacturer. I have a lot of patents that I could actually help you to improve this. Uh, and if the project is workable, I would like to have actually the ability to roll out okay, new prototypes okay, of this product for the world. So you see a collaboration where labs of NTU okay, working with the research centers of Volvo okay, coming together to do a try partnership with LTA. Okay? And, and these are actually some of the things that you see okay, when it comes to business model. So can you disrupt actually the traditional bus industry? Of course it will. Can you imagine buses without drivers? Okay, the labor cost will be a tremendous saving. And furthermore, it's intelligent enough okay, be, to be able to be configured for many other purposes. So I think that there's a lot of potential okay, in this, this autonomous bus, right? Okay, uh, I've come to almost the end, okay? So, but usually in, in, my, in all my webinars itself, I would like to have people uh, to spend some time to have a food for thought, okay, in terms of business model. So I'm not going to ask the audience, don't worry. Okay, but typically this is what I normally do when I go into class, I will encourage you to spend some time, run through, think about it, how many business models these companies have, you know, um, just for the purpose of discussion, okay? And also to facilitate more cross-pollination of ideas, okay? So before uh, I answer questions, these are some of the programs I'll be involved. Okay, the Certified Business Innovator, which is starting next Tuesday, I will be the faculty during that. But what I can promise in this class is quite different from what you're seeing now. Okay, in this webinar, because of time, I cannot deep dive into many things, but in the proper class, I will allow you to have the flexibility and also the liberty to ask a lot of questions, okay? So that we can examine each of these exciting business models. Okay, I'm also involved in actually a few other programs that like you can see, so respective studies. Innovation is something very close to my heart and it's very, very close to the syllabus of these programs as well. All right. Okay, questions, anyone? Um, if you do have questions, I would like to trouble you, okay, to post questions in the Q&A or in the chat group so I can answer them um, and I can actually give more feedback to every one of you. Any questions? Okay, let's see. Um, are there any questions, anyone? Okay, let me just, I think there's a question coming in. Um, how does a personal coaching work? Um, I'm not exactly sure what do you mean by personal coaching though, uh, for SK's question. So maybe SK, you would like to elaborate a bit more. Um, so I, I need to know exactly what type of personal coaching you're referring to as an in innovation personal coaching or are you talking about consultancy or are you talking about class? Okay, so I would appreciate if you can actually elaborate a bit more. Right? Okay. Um, any questions from the rest of the audience? Anyone? Okay. Um, so I have a question from Ho. How to enable or find partners? Okay. Um, I hope you're referring to business partners in this case. Okay. How to enable business partners? I think first you have to examine your relationship with them. Okay. Uh, exactly what kind of relationship are you working on? Are you talking about a delivery relationship? Are you talking about a collaboration relationship? Okay. Or are you talking about even a risk man um, sharing relationship? Okay. So collaboration relationship. Okay. Then my, my, my answer to you for whole, okay, if you're looking for collaboration, then the question is, who are the ones who are likely to value add to your value proposition, okay, to your activities? For example, in the case of a hotel, okay, you definitely will know who are your suppliers, right? Usually the food suppliers or 
maybe the equipment suppliers. Okay, so among this group of suppliers, who are the ones who forms your downline and who are the ones who forms your upline? Okay, or it could even literally be across, for example, your competitors. Competitors can be your partner. It need not be someone who is actually um, like helping you or serving you. It can be someone who's against you. Okay, so the question how to enable, I think first you need to examine okay, the nature of your business, what industry are you in, okay, and the type of relationship that you like to have before you go about sourcing. Okay, so it's a bit broad based, so I'm afraid I may not be able to answer you, uh, but what I can work, I can leave you with is, uh, you'll be best for you to examine your upline, your downline, and literally across um, your competition. Okay, and to answer Suresh, uh, Suresh, yes, this is this course is delivered online. Um, I will have be I will be delivering it through Zoom. Okay, so there will not be a need for you to actually uh, come to campus. Okay, face to face, etc. Okay, uh, but obviously I, I would love to see you in person. Okay, at least through the the video sharing function in Zoom. Right. Okay. Any other questions besides that? Um, because I think there are any other questions, you can just post it in chat or the Q&A. Okay. Okay, um, I think SK has another question. Part of the six week online innovators series, you mentioned live coaching. Okay, live coaching is like, for example, what I'm gonna share with you now. Okay, where I will actually walk you through each of these techniques. Okay, and because this is a webinar, there are certain constraints that I will not be able to do in real class. For example, in an hour's time, okay, I cannot deep dive into too many business models. I cannot share with you too much of the contents because time doesn't permit in the first place. So in the in the actually the online um, business model course, what we'll do is that we will actually be looking at certain cases, okay, and then we'll break you into different groups, okay, where you go about this class through teamwork, through case studies, and then we reconfigure some of these actually innovation or tactics that's possible. Uh, in fact, the question you're asking, SK, that will be a best uh, answer if you attended my last webinar, okay, where I share 100 innovation tactics and strategies. So the personal coaching comes in that in a manner, right? Okay, so um, any last questions that I have from the, uh, from the ground? Okay, if you have any questions after this, um, okay, you can always check with my colleague, Emily. Okay, so Emily will be able to help me to answer some of your questions. And if not, I will look forward to seeing every one of you again. Um, whether I'll have a next webinar, uh, I think it, it depends, okay, because we, we have literally two webinars back to back this month. So you, even if there's another webinar, you'll probably be maybe a month from now also. So I'm not sure at this moment. So you just want to check back with Emily from time to time, all right? Okay, if there are no questions, thank you very much. So um, I wish you actually the best of the day forward. Okay, and I hope to see you in class soon. Thank you, have a good day. Bye.